comes into play. And I don't think you can just walk away from feelings like that. I've been around a lot of social movements, but the one thing that's unique about the genital integrity movement is that it's all tragedy through and through. Something, something horrible happened to all of them to bring them here. Nobody, nobody came here feeling good about circumcision and then got involved. It's because something's happened to them or something's happened to somebody that they care about that's ruined their life. And I don't think that's too strong of a, a phrase either. Circumcision fundamentally changes you forever. I went through what's called the obsessive epiphany. Everybody knows who works in this business knows the epiphany. It's the moment when you, you go over the top on this issue and you realize that there's more here than meets the eye. And that even though it's normative in your culture, there's something strange about it. So I started doing the late night research, which virtually anybody that you interview on this subject will tell you about the late night research. You just, it becomes, it, it takes over your life. You're reading everything and you're reading the footnotes to the footnotes to the footnotes and going deeper and deeper and getting more and more and more horrified and more and more angry. I mean, I can't even remember what I did, but I'm sure I put circumcision in the Google window if Google even existed then and just went from there. And there's just a massive literature on the subject, a massive literature you could spend a lifetime reading it all, whether whether from a religious perspective, anthropological, sociological, legal, medical, bioethical, name your field and discipline, and it has something on the subject. So, I mean, for the serious scholar, there's just endless opportunities there to, to horrify yourself, and amaze yourself, and wonder why this ever got started. I went to my first intactivist gathering. They were some of the most interesting people I had ever met. We were having my fourth child in the hospital. That night, we came across Marilyn Mihalos, who was a nurse in the hospital. I discovered that there were activists out there, in particular Marilyn Mihalos. Marilyn Mihalos, who we consider the mother of us all, who started sounding the call 30 odd years ago. I went back to school um, to be certified as a nurse midwife. My last rotation, May of 1979, I witnessed a circumcision. And that's when I realized the horror of what we're due to babies behind closed doors. And I'd never heard a scream like that come out of the mouth of a human being before. I started to cry, and I was standing next to the baby to comfort him. And the doctor saw me. I just couldn't control myself, and I'm projectile tears. And he looked at me and said, there's no medical reason for doing this. So not only was I watch, witnessing a torture and mutilation of a baby, I was also hearing that it wasn't necessary. And then, my, of course, the question is, well, why, why then are we doing it? But as I began to inform parents, as I became informed and, and, and informed the other nurses, the head nurse came to me one day and she said, I, I, there's somebody on the floor who's um, upsetting patients by talking about circumcision. And I said, well, we're all doing the education. Our job as nurses is to educate. And they said, well, we can't have you upsetting the patients, Marilyn. So in 1985, when I was fired, that's when we became a nonprofit organization. We filed a lawsuit in 1982. A little boy was circumcised, a mother didn't want it, the father did. We went to the Superior Court and the judge then said, because circumcision is the oldest surgery known to man, and because of the court's reluctance to interfere with family life, uh, we're going to just say that it's okay for the, you know, the, this is a decision that's up to the parents. So nobody was ready to hear it. But I think that that is how this sort of began burgeoning forth into the media and so forth. And the backlash with the show-ins and the, the AAP. I got interested in circumcision in the 1987 when I was asked by American Academy of Pediatrics to chair the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force on Circumcision. The reason why they formed that task force uh, was because uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics had actually put its foot in its mouth in 1971. Uh, that somebody wrote a single sentence, we don't even know who wrote it, saying there are no valid medical indications for newborn circumcision. The American Academy of Pediatrics came out firmly against circumcision and said there was unnecessary, there was no reason for it. And there was a howl of complaint from their membership from having performed this surgery for so long and suddenly turning their back on it. But that became the official policy of the American Academy of Pediatrics, no valid indication and the anti circ still 
go back to that all the time. So they have a vested interest in maintaining the procedure, in not angering the 70 million American men who are circumcised, and admitting nothing. It completely was out of line with what the function of the committee was to show that there are indications. So that was that until my committee. And he went in with the same laundry list of excuses. I know he uh, finagled his way into that position. One of the things I said before I took the job, I says, I don't want this committee to be under the thumb of the committee of the fetus and newborn, which put out the other one. And another doctor who was on that committee at one point threw his hands up in the air and said, I'm out of here. This is, this is un undemocratic. You came in expecting to railroad a position through. We had one neonatologist on the committee who was very committed to the old position. And as a matter of fact, before we even had our first meeting, he said, I'm, I ain't going to change my mind. The evidence has just been accumulating in favor. And every month you look at it, there's another article, I can't keep up with it. There's one guy that keeps sending me new papers. Ryan, stop sending me another HPV paper. So what I'm going to tell you today is that male circumcision is better for genital health, public health, and individual well-being. The reason I became passionate about it is because I'm passionate about science and evidence-based medicine. Um, and I became aware that there are individuals in society 